So I think that uh, we should, uh, should get underway. And uh, welcome, good morning. Uh, you're now attending a session entitled, What is the Future of Libraries and Academic Research? So this, if it's not uh, what you intended, uh, you uh, uh, will uh, understand your departure. Um, I'm uh, Tom Hickerson, and I'm Principal Research Investigator at the University of Calgary and I'm the lead investigator for the project that underlies the findings we'll report on today. Academic research and university libraries creating a new model for collaboration, supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I've also just recently completed serving uh, the past 12 years as vice provost and university librarian at Calgary. My colleagues here today are John Brose, project coordinator for this grant, who also serves the library in the areas of visualization and data management, and Suzanne Goopy. Suzanne is a cultural anthropologist and associate professor in the Faculty of Nursing at Calgary. She was the lead investigator in one of our subgrant projects funded by the grant. Soon after the arrival of the World Wide Web in the 1990s, Many faculty left the library, and most have not returned. They could access the databases and, and electronic journals, which we licensed on their desktops, and there was little more that they needed from the libraries for their research. Increasingly, they did not even need those, as they drew on an information environment beyond the library purchases. Although in this age of information ubiquity, they still occasionally drew on our various types of special collections. But the nature of academic research has been changing. It has become ever more multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. The nature of society's grand challenges require a diversity of knowledge sets and methodologies. Recognizing these changes with support from the Office of the Vice President for Research at the University of Calgary. In the fall of 2015, we conducted three days of workshops, which included participation in thematically designed sessions by 50 scholars from 15 disciplines, inquiring of them what were the needs in conducting multidisciplinary research today. In addition to Calgary scholars, three research from three other Canadian universities contributed to the, to the discussions in order to broaden the dialogue beyond the Calgary experience. The workshops were moderated by outside facilitators and a small group of library and research services staff attended, but only as observers. I spoke at the beginning of the workshops and at the close of the workshops, seeking to avoid librarians' tendency to decide what researchers need and then to explain to them why they need it. These were our principal findings. And I'll clarify that in the case of digitization, this was not the creation of digital collections, but the selective research-driven uh, digitization of documents in order to apply computational uh, analytical techniques. And in the case of metadata services, uh, this is metadata as a service. Uh, research material needs uh, very effective uh, metadata schema uh, for description, retrieval, and reuse. And often scholars uh, need project-specific applications. In order to instantiate these new capabilities, we pursued additional funding and that would allow us to um, uh, fund competitive subgrants of about $40,000 each and uh, in thematic areas reflecting university research priorities in the arts, humanities, and social and environmental sciences. Through the resulting partnerships with the library staff, we created a research platform, an aggregation and integration of library services, expertise, and infrastructure that would support 
today's multidisciplinary research. This platform now reflects the addition of virtual reality and web programming, which is an enabling element for all the other services and also important to knowledge translation. As you will see in the presentations, expertise and training is realized through interactivity throughout the projects. And so I'll now turn it over to John Bros to describe the projects and the process. So, um, just to give you an idea of how sort of the subgrants were issued and that process went, uh, we started off with a letter of intent, and this was adjudicated by a committee made up of half uh, senior library people and half senior research academics. And so they adjudicated, they select the successful letters of intent, and then we hosted sort of a development meeting for each research team, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, after. That, we had a full proposal from the research team, which was again adjudicated. Um, and from there, we, we had the successful projects um, that went on for six months in the first round and eight months in the second round. And then at the completion of the project, we had the library staff, we had the research leads and to report back on how the process went. And then we featured an external review where we had experts from United States and Canada look at the process and sort of give us feedback on how things were looking. The projects themselves, uh, we wanted them to be multidisciplinary. Um, part of the adjudication evaluation was whether they had substantial work with the library. So whether they were either, you know, contributing to that platform, whether they were making extensive use of that platform, but we wanted to see real involvement with the library. Um, and as Tom mentioned, we had uh, three research themes, smart cities, cultural discourse, and Arctic studies, which tied it into our university research priorities. Um, up there, that wordle is just um, the home departments of the various uh, investigators involved in successful projects. Um, the development meetings were really kind of a key part of uh, sort of crafting these projects so that you know, we'd get the most out of them and the researchers would get the most out of them. Uh, we invited sort of all the library personnel we could feel that were relevant at all to the projects, involving people from all across the library. Usually we had between half a dozen and a dozen people at each meeting, uh, in addition to the research team. Uh, at the meetings, we went through the feedback from the adjudication committee, and as well as library feedback. So often suggesting things like, you know that metadata services can actually train your grad students to do the data collection and some things that maybe the researchers weren't aware of with uh, the library's offerings. And really the focus in these meetings was to be generative, um, sort of expand ideas, expand different potential possibilities and not constrict things. Um, and we had really good feedback from the adjudication committee that they saw really huge changes in the proposals from that letter of intent to the full proposal. So they were quite glad to see that evolution of the projects. Um, looking at sort of evaluation for the first round, we're right in the midst of our second round right now. Um, some things that we heard were, it was nice for the researchers to have a single point of contact. As a coordinator, I was kind of there for anything they felt was missing or not going quite right. They had one person to reach out to and then I could connect them where they needed to go. Um, in our first round, we didn't have data management plans and we found that um, no data would suddenly pop up here and pop up there, or there was a server needed here, a server needed there. And so um, with sort of the push for data management plans to be required coming from funding to the agency soon in Canada, we thought, you know, on the second round, let's get ahead of the game and uh, have them go through this process. And we've just sort of completed that for all our current projects, and it really is giving us a leg up on things. Um, it's helped our project management at the library. Um, we've been now utilizing some cloud-based web tools to help us keep organized, keep track of all the timelines for the projects, share materials, um, just so that you know all the people in the diverse parts of the library are on the same page and know what's currently happening in the project. 
um, and it's promoted a lot of intercommunication between our different units. Um, and it wasn't always the case that uh, digitization and metadata would talk, you know, more than a couple times a year, and so this is getting them working really closely together, familiar with um, sort of making, uh, communicating where they're at on these projects all the time. And the other thing we saw is that staff really enjoyed uh, this work. Um, often people you know, don't get to touch research directly, and so a lot of our staff really appreciated this chance to try new things, to sort of explore some of the stuff they hadn't. Um, I really like a quote from our metadata librarian who was you know, a brand new hire at the time of the start, and she said, you know, I didn't think that coming out of school I'd be sort of right in the middle of three or four research projects kind of a couple months into my career. So it's been, you know, a great experience for all involved. Uh, so bringing things back to the research platform, I'm going to quickly go through sort of all 12 projects, uh, just in a flash hurry. Um, and I'm going to have these icons for the different platform elements on each slide, just showing you what uh, functional services each of the projects was making use of. So the first project, I was aiming to create a repository for local city data. Um, they really were interested in data from community associations, nonprofits, and researchers. And this was something that uh, really wasn't in the scope of what the city was doing, and so they created their own repository for doing this. Um, and they already got really 15 robust data sets and then sort of 30 other data sets that they're looking to from elsewhere. Um, the next project is digitizing a special collection uh, on uh, speculative fiction, on early speculative fiction. And so their real focus was on capturing material properties that often mass digitization efforts sort of miss. So things like the paper materials and close-ups on, you know, what the text and the fonts and things looked like. Um, and their, their, their specific path focus to start was, can they tell the difference between the pulps and the glossy magazines for this early science fiction? Um, this project, uh, they do laser scans of cultural heritage sites. They were looking for a place to sort of store this data as well as sort of a public face to show uh, the public about these sites. Um, and so we sort of created a new system for them where the data went into our data repository. We created a nice WordPress website that was tied to the data repository, but also the research team could edit and adjust um, according to what was happening in their research. Arctic Sensor Web is a project that has deployed um, environmental monitoring stations all through the Canadian North, um, collecting mostly weather data, but some other environmental data as well. And what they want to do is give back to their local communities. Um, often weather is of crucial importance, and so they went through a user experience and visualization sort of process to create a website that would sort of effectively communicate this data to the local communities and not just be something that the researchers would gather and look at once a year. Um, this project's compiling a data set of Victorian authors, editors, publishers, and illustrators. Um, and they're really sort of investigating how um, location and association impacted the success of these various people. Um, and this is particularly pertinent for women um, who weren't in sort of the more formal organizations like clubs and publishers' dinners. And so this is a way they can get a feel for who was working with whom at that time. Um, and sort of an interesting element of this one is that they're hosting a Victorian conference uh, in the spring, um, and they're creating a, a web system for doing some, not crowdsourcing, but expert sourcing to gather some of the material that would be hard to come by. Um, this project is exploring um, whether smart cities are actually healthy. So they're looking at links between economic factors associated with smart cities and the health of population. Um, from the library side, we were quite interested in this project as they're using two different sort of data sources in our library. Uh, we have spatial and numeric data services that help people with aggregate data from Stats Canada um, and a variety of sources all over the place. We also in our library have um, a research data center, which is a Stats Canada entity that provides restricted access to microdata and individual records. And so beyond using the two data sets, they're also gonna be hosting a workshop for our local researchers on how to do that, reproduce what they're doing, um, and not hit the same pitfalls that they'll encounter. Um, this project makes use of a special collection uh, material from Alice Monroe. 
And uh, they're starting from um, finding out data that was sort of compiled a couple decades ago. And they're using da data visualization to explore this, um, answer some research questions, but also sort of further develop those research questions and use the data visualization to sort of explore where they need to dedicate their students' time to expanding that metadata. Um, SOPRA's World is a project from the Arctic Institute of North America. They have almost 200 paintings from J.D. Soper and his Arctic exploration in the 1920s. And um, you know, beyond the research value of making this available and sort of expanding the metadata with these paintings, um, they're also creating an online virtual exhibit that will help out, um, that really is aimed towards um, primary school teachers, um, as well as creating a, um, material for an exhibit that they'll be doing next year. Um, this is another digitization project where they're digitizing physical bee specimens. Um, and it provides our library experience working with um, local research on a natural history collection. Um, and so this project has a strong evaluative component, working with our engineering faculty on bio-inspired design and city urban planners that are looking at sort of um, the biology of the city and uh, making sure that the website and finding aids and things that are printed together are useful for non-specialists. Um, the next project works in our maker space and what they're really focused on is moving beyond sort of one-to-one -one teaching to learn this new technology, new techniques. Um, they want, they're aiming to create sort of software and a system for mixed, creating mixed reality videos to help people self-learn. And then to evaluate the success of that, they're working with um, teacher candidates to evaluate um, how all that works for them picking up these new technologies in their teaching. Um, in this project, they have three months of data from 300 undergraduates' uh, cell phones tracking their GPS locations over campus. Um, and they're anonymizing the data set, of course, uh, but their focus is, you know, how do you visualize, you know, that much location data changing over time? Um, and they've got a really interested group of architects that are practicing in our downtown and they're really interested in how this sort of data can inform the design of campuses and buildings. And so they're going to be doing a set of iterative design sessions where they look at how they can visualize this data and make that useful to that audience. And the last project I'm going to mention, um, I'll just talk real quick because Suzanne's here. Um, she's uh, put forward a methodology called empathic cultural mapping that provides knowledge translation and exchange on data she's gathered from recent immigrants on their experiences in our healthcare system. Uh, but before I turn over to Suzanne, I just want to show um, sort of this crazy bar chart. Um, every one of those dots is one of the projects, and I've sort of grouped them based on the different functional services. And so we can see that the usage really reflects that of uh, the workshops Tom mentioned that happened in 2015. So we've seen a huge draw on data curation and metadata services, but also the projects are really quite spread across the different functional areas. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sam. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here today as a library user. This morning, I'll share a little bit about my work as a researcher in community health and talk a little bit about the project and the process that led, my findings, uh, led to my findings uh, prompting me to think about new ways of engaging with my old friend, the library. My research work focuses on experiences of newcomers which include refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants. Health and emotional wellness are two of the strongest determinants of long-term successful integration. These are inextricably tied to the infrastructure and to the environment. As Briggs and Cooper 2015 show us, there is a significant relationship between post-migratory experiences and distress among newcomers. Indeed, as soon as six to 12 months after arrival, many factors, for example, employment, skill matching, language support, social networks, community identity, feeling, um, 
feeling accepted by the host society and being able to participate in the community and social activities begin to have a negative impact on health and wellness. In a country where mass migration, voluntary or forced, is growing, held identities and institutional habits are challenged. And so against this backdrop of a 21st century on the move, educators, researchers and liberal governments seek to find ways to respond effectively to the unplanned disruption of held knowledges, institutional practices and expectations. The research project that I will soon show you, and I will show it to you, sought to find ways to open dialogue within and between multiple groups so that health and emotional wellness are considered in all the decisions that we as a society make. So where does this leave the library and librarians? I hear you ask. You may not have asked that, but. <laughs> a better question is perhaps, where does it leave me as the library user? Well, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. That much I do know. Studying humanities in the 1980s was my first introduction to the academic library. And it was one of paper slips and carbon copies in search of articles and interlibrary loans. I spent a great deal of my time sitting in carols and writing longhand. There were no such things as laptops or let alone iPads. Card files and serendipity and the knowledge is held by the li liaison librarian were the only way to access knowledge. The library and its librarians were the holders and gatekeepers of knowledge. And at the very least, they had the roadmap and the means to read it. This, however, is no longer the world of the library nor the world of the researcher. The digital age has changed how we research and how we manage and how we imagine the library. If I, as a researcher, have grown ever more independent from the library as a place for accessing knowledge, then what is the role of the library for someone like me? I believe that the answer to this lies in the question itself. The changing scope of what I can do as a researcher has also created for me a new way to imagine the library. It's now time for me to re-see myself in the library. In my work as a visual and social anthropologist, the digital age has allowed me to find ways to engage my participants in my research practices in, in new and exciting ways. No longer do I only have transcripts from interviews or notes from my participant observation or st descriptive statistics from the odd survey. Rather, I have images, audio, video, drawings, sketches. And if I want, I can, I can also have, with relatively easy access, big data. With all of this comes the next challenge. What can I possibly do with all of this data? And even more problematic, how could I ever do what I want to do with this data? I now see the possibilities and opportunities which go beyond the journal art, what the journal article can, can contain. How to, make the knowledge, how to make the knowledge that I want to share accessible, not only to the usual subjects, suspects, who I actually doubt even read those journal articles, but in fact to a broad multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral audience. Especially knowing that knowledge does not always flow comfortably between intersections. The result of this long journey has been the development of empathic cultural mapping. As an anthropologist, I like maps. I am always wanting to locate people to understand what their world looks like and to understand it in context. And so in some ways, it was inevitable that my work would, would become empathic cultural mapping. Um, but how this was to be realized was a very different matter. The ECM, short for empathic cultural mapping, has one main objective to reach out and to engage a broad audience, both traditional and non-traditional, so that we can actively encourage others to open dialogue within and between multiple groups, so that health and emotional wellness are considered in all the decisions we take. So what is ECM? Well, simply, it's an interactive way to locate small data within big data and big data within small data. Simple, really. 
And since its launch, it's been well received. It's, it is, and, but it, as it's a rather large platform, I'd like to just show you a short but sweet story that was made about it by Global News Calgary earlier this year. That's Amir Ahmed's assessment of the city she now calls home. Ahmed moved here from Egypt two years ago. Did you find it hard to navigate the city because it was such, so yes. big? Yes, at the beginning I did. The city's bus system was one challenge, but eventually Abed figured it out. I kind of lived on the Calgary Transit website in terms of times and when to, when to leave and, and how long to expect, so this is something that we never had before. Experiences like Abed's are now being explored on this screen. It's called Empathic Cultural Mapping, a process that merges the personal stories of Calgary's newcomers with big data from agencies like Stats Canada. It's a way to engage people that would normally shy away from lots and lots of numbers and statistics. So by placing them on maps like we have here, it, it makes it actually more accessible. University of Calgary nursing professor Suzanne Goopy worked on the project for roughly two years. The map looks at how the city's makeup impacts overall health. Take transportation, for example. If you can't get around the city, if you can't make it to your, your job, your health will suffer if you can't make it to your health appointments. So we need to look at those sorts of things. Which is why Goopy argues that seemingly small policy changes, like an adjustment to a bus route, can severely impact a newcomer's life. It's actually bringing the siloed elements that we've always known affect our health and well-being into a conversation, into dialogue. And she hopes the discussion will now include voices like Abed going forward whenever policymakers make impacts on our everyday lives. Joel Senek, Global News. Oh. You don't want to hear it, see it again. Thank you. So as you can see, ECM is a knowledge translation and exchange project. It seeks to make research accessible and usable. It encourages us to think about both qualitative and quantitative data differently. And with research that is underpinned by principles of social justice, equity and kindness, it translates these into tangible and usable entity. In this way, these themes are not only carried through in its content and presentation, but are built into the way people are encouraged to use the platform to interact with the project. In short, the ECM has become a way of opening up and developing a new relationship with the library, both in terms of its construction, but also in terms of the library's roles in its dissemination. Because without that, I couldn't have done this. The project had wide appeal and saw stakeholders from Alberta Health Services uh, and researchers from, and various staff from the municipal government and many from immigrant serving agencies all to come together in the library. Oh, oh I've, sorry. Sorry about that. Oh, what have I done? Uh, <laughs> I've broken it. <laughs> Thank goodness I have a librarian with me. <laughs> Help me find my way. <laughs> John, are we on slide seven? We should be on. So librarians are holders of knowledge and in their capacity as consultants and guides, they are also wayfinders. Libraries and librarians, for me, are not as they once were. They're, they're, this is no longer the 1980s, and times have changed. Achieving this KTE project was a considerable undertaking, and one for which I needed help, as it turned out, the help of an entire village. When I orig originally conceived this idea, I wasn't certain where that village was to be found. For although, as Joan Lippincott said during the Designing Libraries conference earlier this year, the library is Switzerland, to be honest, in recent years, and before this project, the library had begun to take on an appearance more akin to that of a Kentucky tour, with very little to offer me. This is no longer true, for I am now once more the library user, albeit a different kind of library user. 
The key challenge facing me as a researcher is that knowledge is itself complex and its reception is fluid. Effective knowledge translation and exchange is thus the space in which we can think about with others. The library and the librarians made this possible. The Andrew Mellon subgrant that was, I was awarded for this project has meant that my days of a remote association with the library have class come to an end. In undertaking the project, I've engaged with the library and the librarians in, in ways that I had never dreamed of. As a library using anthropologist, I have found my village. I've learned the value of metadata even if I continue to be a little bamboozled by it, I now know that I need it and that it is good for me. <laughs> I have become enthralled by census data and other large data sets that are managed by the librarians in SANS, which is something I never thought I would or could do. I have a better understanding of copyright and IP, or at least I know that I need to ask the question. And I continue to appreciate what I've already known, the importance of digitization and archival services, and of course, good old liaison librarians. I've discovered that audiovisual is an essential part of the library, and not as I had thought, just for collections, but also somewhere to go for creation. I've even learned about areas in the library that I, had, uh, that I haven't actually yet been able to incorporate into my research. Although I am feeling inspired and trying to find ways to incorporate the embroidery machine that they have in the makerspace, or perhaps even the 3D printer in a project to come, watch this space. So librarians in the library have turned out to be a village, the, the, the village that I've been looking for. They've become key in supporting me and allowing me to develop my research in a direction that you've just seen. The most valuable element that I've taken from this project, apart from the realization of the creation of the Empathic Cultural Map is my own renewed and revitalized relationship with the world of the library, and more particular, the librarians themselves. It has become my second home, and even now that the project is over, I cannot stay away from there too long. When colleagues say, where have you been? We haven't seen you. I say, you haven't been looking for me in the library, because that's where you'll probably find me lurking. Further, as this project has rolled out, I've been heartened and surprised by the positive reception it's had, um, such as the global news story that we saw, um, or the request to present this, pol to this project to policymakers and senior staff within municipal government. None of that would have been possible without the library and the librarians I worked with. And to quote Foucault, because somebody has to, people know what they do Frequently, they know why they do what they do, but what they do, don't know is what what they do does. The librarians I worked with probably have never thought that it is because of what what they do does that I have had the opportunity to ask policymakers and senior staff in the city of Calgary to think about what what they do does. So as a library user, I've entered into a new relationship with the library and its librarians. And I'm glad to be back in Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you, John, Suzanne. Um, so this is uh, is the uh, is the conclusion, and um, and it's uh, terribly important. Um, we we really have to change. Um, so uh, we'll start out with uh, uh, moving from a disciplinary to a uh, a functional organization. Um, I think um, everybody uh, knows this. But in fact, the change is, is more substantial than they think because it changes both roles and relationships within the library, uh, but also on our campuses. And also, as, uh, as, as John's uh, presentation illustrated, um, being able to support a diversity of research uh, endeavors um, through a, a, a research platform also offers economies of scale and not one-off sol solutions. 
So uh, turning to digital media and tools, um, this new synthesis is really about our thinking about content uh, selection and investments in context with the technologies and the tools and the expertise that be, will be necessary to effectively use uh, that acquired material. And um, this is, uh, this new synthesis is really going to be a very important change. I uh, hope we can make it. Turning to um, research resources and research experience, we really need to use the experience of research as a way to, uh, to choose research resources. Um, uh, I will say that uh, of all 12 projects that we ran, only one time were we asked for a resource uh, that we had to uh, uh, subscribe to in the traditional method. And even in this one instance, it was a, a, an un unconventional uh, example. And uh, so what does that tell us? So um, moving to uh, uh, partnerships rather than transactions. Uh, libraries have categorized and counted uh, transactions uh, for decades. Um, but it's actually through deep engagement that we will really uh, learn what the nature of research needs are and be able to augment the capacity of researchers in a, uh, in a substantive way. So um, permanence to permeability. Uh, I, uh, I, I just uh, met uh, uh, Jeannie uh, Naram uh, about an hour ago that I, I talked with a, uh, just a week ago, and I want to actually thank her um, for uh, connecting for me that relationship or emphasizing it between not only being uh, shaped by um, the researcher's experience, but also to be open uh, to really uh, reformulating our spaces uh, and our roles within those spaces and uh, a, a process of a continual openness uh, to the process underway. So uh, turning to uh, the moment we are in now, uh, Unanimous, I mean, who ever heard of Unanimous and ARL? Uh, but uh, I think all of us in academic uh, libraries know um, that this change is not only necessary, but it's actually uh, vital. And uh, uh, like the way we did in the, uh, in the 1990s, the alacrity that we showed in moving to information commons uh, we need even greater speed uh, in change today, uh, but it's more challenging professionally than information commons were for us. And it also involves repositioning uh, ourselves uh, within our, uh, our campus and the larger uh, academic environment. So um, we can remain uh, outstanding learning spaces uh, but if we do not achieve this redefinition, our value and our importance will be substantively diminished. Thank you.